Hi, welcome to Concept Capsules. The topic that we're going to look at today is the dividend discount model. Now, this is primarily from a CFA level one perspective because we are going to look at the basics of the DDM, but you can also use this as a primer for CFA level two dividend discount model where you have an entire chapter on uh, this topic. So let's look at what dividend discount model is all about. Now, DDM is one of the valuation methods that's used for valuing a stock. Now, in this method, what we do is we forecast what the future dividends are going to be. We also forecast what the exit value is going to be, and then we discount all of them to the time right now, which is time period zero. We can use DDM for valuing preferred stock as well as the common equity, which is the riskier version of the two. Now for common stock, we will be looking at a one-year holding period, two-year holding period, we'll extend that to a multi-year holding period, and ultimately, we'll extend that to an infinite year holding period, where we will be looking at the Gordon growth model. So first, let's look at how to value preferred stock using DDM. Now, what is a preferred stock? How does it really work? Now, in a preferred stock, you keep getting the same amount of dividend on that particular stock forever. So if you think about it, preferred stock is pretty much like a perpetuity. So the formula is also just like any perpetuity. So preferred stock would pay you the same dividend each year. So the formula is just like a perpetuity. What is the formula for a perpetuity? That's C divided by R. C is the cash flow that you have that remains the same every year. R is your discounting rate. So a preferred stock value will be where you are uh, basically discounting the same dividend every single year. This is just a perpetuity. So instead of C, we end up putting dividend because that is the preferred stock dividend is what the cash flow is in this perpetuity. Instead of the discounting rate, we use the cost of preferred equity. So DP by KP becomes the formula for the preferred stock value. Now, what are the important points to consider here? Now, first of all, remember, we're trying to value a preferred stock that's inherently less risky compared to you know, a, a common stock because you have preferential treatment when it comes to payment of dividends as well as when you are uh, you know, making the final liquidation payout. So it's less risky than common stock. So the discount rate that we are using should also be lesser than what we use for common equity. So the discount rate should be lower than common shares. If you have a special category of preferred stock, such as let's say you have a participating preferred, you have a convertible preferred, then you'll have to modify the dividend and discount rates accordingly. Now let's do a simple example on valuing a preferred stock. Calculate the value of a preferred stock when discount rate K is equal to 10% and the dividend is $5. Now remember, we treat it just like any perpetuity. So we take the cash flow in the numerator and we take the discount rate in the denominator and that's the end of it. So C by R, which means five, which is your dividend, divided by 10%. So that's what your answer is going to be. Now, in this case, now formula is quite straightforward. One common error that could actually happen is that instead of taking C by R, you end up taking C divided by one plus R because you're so used to discounting and the timeline that you forget that you're only supposed to take R because this is a perpetuity. So make sure you don't uh, forget that. Do not do five divided by one plus 10%. It's only five divided by 10%. So that's what your answer is. The value of the preferred stock is simply $50. All right, now moving on to common equity. Of course, valuing the common stock is a lot tougher. Why? Because we don't know what the size of the cash flow will be. So that's one reason. So the size of the cash flow is going to be uncertain. We don't know what is the dividend that we're going to get. We don't know the timing of the cash flow as well. So we might get dividend one year, then for another two or three years, we might not get a dividend and then we suddenly get a higher dividend. So we don't know the timing of the cash flow either. Finally, we don't even know the required rate of return. We need to estimate that. So we'll typically use models such as CAPM to estimate what the required rate of return should be on common equity. Now let's start with the very basic model, which is a one year holding period model. And this is something that can be easily extended to two year, three year, multiple year holding period. Now one year holding period means 
that our assumption is that the investor is going to sell the share at the end of the first year. So we are only going to hold that stock for one year. So we receive the dividend in that time period and we exit the investment after one year. So what are the two things that we need? We need to know what is the dividend that we are receiving. We also need to estimate the year end exit value. So what will be the value at which or what will be the price at which we'll be able to sell the stock after one year? So that is again an estimation which you need to do. Once you've estimated this, you need to estimate what the discounting rate is going to be. And you use models such as the capital asset pricing model. So I hope you guys remember that CAPM, what is the formula for CAPM? Remember, it's one of our 4 a.m. formulas. You should know this formula even if you were to be woken up at 4 a.m. So I hope you remember that. The formula for CAPM was you start with RF, which is your risk-free rate of return, plus beta times expected return in the market minus the risk-free rate. So this part was your market risk premium. So that gives you the cost of equity. So that's one of the ways in which you determine the cost of equity. Of course, there are many more models available to do that. And it will be it will be dependent upon your judgment, which one do you decide to go in for. But for now, we'll use CAPM. So for a one year holding period, what are the cash flows that we are looking at? We are talking about a timeline such as this. You have zero and you have one. We look at what is the dividend that you're going to receive. So that means D1. And we look at the year end price. That is something that we have to estimate. That is P1. We take all of these, take both these values and then we discount them back to time period zero. So the value is the dividend to be received divided by one plus KE, that's raised to power one, plus the year end price divided by one plus KE raised to power one. So either you could do it separately or you can do it together, completely up to you. Now this is a one year holding period. Let's say instead of one year, we had two years holding period, what will we do? We'll simply extend this formula to two years. We don't need to memorize any new formula. Remember, everything is happening on the timeline. If you know timeline, you don't need to memorize any of this. Only difference will be that instead of one, we have two years here. We will only take the dividend for first year. Then we take the dividend for the second year. Instead of looking at the price or estimating the price at the end of the first year, we'll estimate the price at the end of second year. So we have D2 plus P2. We discount the first dividend. Then we discount D2 plus P2 as well for two years. At which rate? At the rate that has been given to us by the capital asset pricing model. So this is how we can extend one year holding period model to any number of time periods. Now let's try out a question on this. So here we have a three year holding period. So for the next three years, the annual dividends are expected to be one euros, 1.5 euro and two euros. The stock price is expected to be 20 euros at the end of three years. Now the required rate of return is 10%. We need to estimate what the value of the share is going to be. Now in this case, what are we going to do? We have all the information that we really require. So if you look at the timeline, your first dividend is one, second is 1.5, and your last dividend in your holding period, which is three years, is two. When you exit the stock, you estimate the price to be 20 euros. So on our timeline, this is the cash flow for year one, this is the cash flow for year two, and year three, you have two plus 20. So let's put that on the timeline. So you have one, 1.5, and two plus 20 here. Discount rate is 10%, that is your cost of equity. So how do we estimate the value of the stock? We simply discount all of these cash flows. So one is discounted for one year, 1.5 is discounted for two years, and two plus 20, that is 22, is discounted for three years. And we simply add the present values of all of these three cash flows. So that's what we've done here. So simply discount them to time period zero because this is where we are making the decision. This is where we are valuing the stock. So simply discount all of them to time period zero, add them up together and you get the current value of the stock according to your assumptions, that is 18.67 euros. So that's how we implement the dividend discount model. We could have done this for one year, two years, whatever the number of periods that we've been given. The next thing that we're looking at is what if we have infinite periods? That means we keep adding all of these dividends till infinity. 
Now, in this case, we assume that the dividends grow at a constant rate of G forever. So we're saying that the company has now gone into a stable stage. It's not the super normal rate of growth anymore. The growth rate has stabilized. So it's in a mature stage now. So that's why we make that assumption that the growth rate is now constant at the value of G forever. So we simplify this particular expression that we have above to this. Now pay a lot of attention to the subscripts that we are using. The value at time period zero is equal to D zero into one plus G divided by the K E minus G. You can put it as K E. Uh, some people like to use the notation as R completely up to you. Now pay attention, as I said, to the subscripts. The value at time period zero will be equal to dividend at time period zero times one plus G. Now, what is the point of doing this D zero into one plus G point is that we want to calculate the dividend in the next period that is D one. So in the question, if you are given D one directly, then use that. Don't multiply that with one plus G further. If D one is given, then use it as it is. If that's not given, you would be given D zero as well as G. So do D zero, just compound that for one period. So D zero into one plus G, uh, that goes into your numerator. Your denominator remains the same. That is K E minus G cost of equity minus the growth rate. The G in the numerator and the denominator is the same. You can't have two different values here. So use the same values. So either do D zero into one plus G or if D one is given, take that straight away. The most important point to remember here and something that people get wrong quite often. So we need to focus on that is again, look at the subscripts. The value today will require you to calculate the dividend in the next period divided by K E minus G. This formula, which is called as the constant growth model or more popularly the GGM, which is the Gordon growth model is, uh, you know, something which is going to come up in your exam easily, right? So this is quite often asked in the exam. It's highly testable material. You need to know this formula. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's as important as uh, remembering CAPM, but make sure you don't confuse the subscripts. So, uh, so you need to be mindful of which time period are we talking about? So for instance, let's say if we have a situation like this, that we are told that after 10 years, the growth rate becomes constant. Then we can apply the Gordon growth model only starting from this point. When the growth rate has become constant, we cannot use it for any period before that. But let's say if the growth rate becomes constant after 10 years, then the dividend that we will need to use will be for the 11th year because we want to calculate the value at 10 years. This is the point where we need the value. So if we want V of 10, then the dividend will be of 11. So make sure you don't forget this bit. So don't start with uh, D 10 and discount that and do basically K E minus G in the denominator. If you are using dividend of 10th period, then remember to further multiply it with G. So either take dividend of 10 into one plus G, or if you're given, take the uh, dividend of the next time period and then divided by the cost of equity minus G. So we need to pay a lot of attention to the time periods. Otherwise you'll get this wrong. Okay. We'll just try it out on a question as well. So we understand it better. So this is, as we said, what is called as the constant growth model or the Gordon growth model. So this is the important point that we were uh, referring to. The value of the share is arrived at at a time zone preceding the year for which dividend has been taken in the numerator. So if you're using D one value will be for zero one time period before that. We can only apply this when the growth rate becomes constant. If your growth rate is changing, then this formula cannot be used. We will go back to our previous formula where we can use different growth rates as well. We can apply this even for using uh, you know, uh, for calculating the value of a preferred stock. How do we do that? The dividend for the preferred stock remains the same. That means the G will be zero. So if we set G to zero, we end up getting D one by K E, which is exactly the formula for a perpetuity. And that's what we did for the preferred stock. Now let's look at an example to understand this. 
So we look at two-stage dividend discount model. Now, what does two-stage dividend discount model really mean? Two-stage means that we are assuming two different stages of growth. So for, for a, a certain uh, number of years, the growth rate is different. After that, the growth rate becomes constant. So the current dividend D0 is $6. The growth is expected to be 10% a year for 10% a year for three years and then 5% thereafter. So you see, we have two different rates of growth and that's why we are calling it as the two-stage TDM. So for the first three years, it is growing at 10% and after that, it grows at 5% forever. Now remember, the Gordon growth model can only be applied when the growth rate is constant. So for your first phase, for the first three years, we cannot use the Gordon growth model. However, after that, when it becomes constant at 5%, we can apply the Gordon growth model. The required rate of return is 12%. We need to estimate the intrinsic value. So as always, we put everything on the timeline. So that's what your timeline is going to be. From, for, from zero to three, it is 10%. After that, it becomes 5% forever. Now, we know the discount rates. What we need to find out are the cash flows that we need to discount. Now, the current dividend is six. So that is what you're getting here. Now, just to avoid confusion, we won't actually write it on the timeline so that, uh, you know, if you were to write it, you might mistakenly end up discounting that as well. So we just don't put it on the timeline at all. Why? Because that's your current dividend. That's something which you've already received. So you do not have to put it again because that's already something that you've received. We only discount those cash flows, which we are yet to receive. But if we don't have D0, then we will not be able to calculate the other ones. So it is still required for calculation. Now D0 is six, and we know that it is going to grow at 10% for three years. So we start with six. The next one will be six into one plus 10%. Similarly, we further multiply it with one plus 10% and get the value here. And again, one plus 10%, we multiply with this value and we get the value for year three dividend. So this is how we will get it. So your first dividend D1 is 6 into 1.1, so that's 6.6. .6. Similarly, we further multiply it with 1.1, basically this. That gives you your second dividend, that is 7.26. And similarly, we get the third dividend. Again, because we are growing the dividend at 10% for three years, it's still at 10% here, so 7.986. That is going to be your dividend in the third year. However, after this point, the dividend is going to grow at 5% forever. So this is where we can apply the Gordon growth formula. So we need to find out what the value of the stock will be at the end of year three. How do we do that? We simply go to the Gordon growth formula. Now, if we need to calculate the value as at, uh, you know, at the end of year three, we need to know what the dividend of year four will be, because remember, D4 divided by KE minus G is what you need to do. That's your Gordon growth formula. Now, what will be the dividend of year four? Third year dividend is 7.986, but that's the last year where the growth happens at 10%. After that, it grows at 5%. So in order to calculate D4, we will start with D3 and multiply this with one plus G, where G is 5%. So 7.986, which we had here, multiplied with 1.05, so that is 8.38. So your D4 is 8.38. Now, in order to calculate the value, or you know, the estimated exit value, we have to divide that by Ke minus G because that's what your Gordon growth formula is. Remember, D0 into one plus G divided by K minus G. We have done D0 into one plus G here already. We need to divide it by the cost of equity minus the growth rate. Your cost of equity is 12%. Growth rate is five. So in your denominator, you will have 12 minus 5%. So that's what you get here. 8.38 divided by 12 minus 5%, 119.79. So that is your exit value. Remember in year three, again, uh, pay attention to this bit don't get so engrossed in calculating the value that you forget that there is a dividend to be added here. 
So the dividend which we calculated here, 7.986, that is something that you're still receiving. So your year three cash flow is actually 7.986 plus the exit value, which is 119.79. So that's what you have here. So 7.986 plus 119.79. Now this becomes just like a question that we did earlier. We know all the cash flows. We know the discount rate. All that we need to do is get it back to present value at time period zero. So we discount all of these cash flows. So that's what you get. 6.60 discounted for one year at 12%, 7.26 discounted for two years, 7.986 plus 119.79, both of them discounted for three years. So that is how we implement the dividend discount model.